Our next panel is called Speaking in Tongues. And for this, I'd like to welcome on stage Anjali Purohit and Sampurna Chatterjee. And in, their, in this session, they will speak about poets as the tongues they inhabit and speak a little bit about their poetry and perhaps read a couple of poems. Over to you, Anjali and Sampurna. Thank you. Uh, Anjali and I had a little powwow and hit upon this title. Um, Anjali, it was Anjali's title. Yes, and uh, what we liked about it was the fact uh, that it enabled us to do exactly as we pleased in the 25 minutes we have. Uh, but on a more serious note, um, because both of us tend to do that, we do inhabit registers that are not necessarily ours. Uh, we bear witness to things that we may not have necessarily experienced. How do we do that in a way that is authentic to the experience without losing our own voices? At least that was the way I understood the title. Anjali, how did you understand it? It was your idea to begin with. Exactly as you did. So without much delay, let's just get on to our various tongues. Over to you. If I read at the speed of an express train, it will be because the, some of the poems I'm going to read today are about trains. They are uh, from my latest book, Over and Underground in Bombay and Paris. Two books for the price of one, Over and Underground in Paris and Mumbai, a collaborative effort with my friend Kartika Nair, illustrated by Joël Jolivet and Roshni Vyam. Um, I'll read two uh, sections from two poems. And the first one is called Western Line. Um, no explanations necessary. Western Line, where was I? It all depended on where you were and where you were going. North from Churchgate, you always took the 550 fast local to Borivali. Borivali of the National Park with the scrawny lions in their cages. You were on the 537 fast from Churchgate to Virar. It was 635 when you lost a leg and your friend his life. Meanwhile, at 624 at Car Road, Santa Cruz, you were waiting for a date. It was the 11th of July, 2006. All figures needed to be written in words in order to numb their sharp edges, their mangled reminders, even uppercase hurt, but veracity demanded that place names stay upright despite the shattering of fixity. You said when they aimed the mic at you the morning after, I have no choice, I am fearless. You said I was on board the 608, the train bombed at Bandra. Bandra Car Road at 624, where you were running into the stone wall of your unliftable silence. It was loud. There was no scalp, just the lower jaw that looked like him. You said, I will not move till the situation is under control. You said, God bless the soul. Meanwhile, at 6.30, between Matunga Road, Mahim Junction, you would never live to rue the day you caught the 5.57 fast from Churchgate to Virar. If only you'd waited for the next one, you might even have got a seat. If only you'd joined your cousin in the second-class coach. If only you'd not been promoted last month and had a first-class pass to show for it. If only the wind had been a warning. If only the sea had been unsalty. If only yesterday came after tomorrow. If only the sirens were not myths. If only six million people weren't real. If only the lamp had been unlit. If only the rain had fallen upwards, you only reached Jogeshwari. Jogeshwari of the link road where cars were jammed as usual and all the buses heaving. On platform one, you saw people moan, you saw people dead, you saw your life before and after. You saw people with no clothes on, you saw faces with no people on, you saw the rip in the universe, and you went blind. Meanwhile, at 
629 at Mira Road, Bhayandar, the Bhayankar had happened. You were going north from Church Gate. You were going north where the pole star lay, true north where your true love sang those songs about windows and pieces of moon, about dupattas and bangles. There where you danced to the tune of Rook, 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 Are Baba Rook, Oh my darling, give me a look. All the silly sweetness of the past and the present and the unimaginable future. You said, I cannot stop traveling by train. You said, it's not a question of resilience, it's a lack of opinions, of options. You said, I have no choice. I am fearless. You said, I can't wait to travel on the same seat of the same coach in which I was traveling on that fateful day. And the second excerpt I'll read also from the opposite side of the same book is from a longer poem called Ghat Koper to Versova and Back, uh, which expresses my great discomfort with comfort. Because this is the air-conditioned metro from Ghat Koper to Versova, in which I ride when I have absolutely no other option and when I'm in a hurry. While I'm in this air-conditioned bubble, I am missing the trains, the Bombay locals. Here, there is no damp, no heat, no fog of swamp and sewer, no noise except the pinging bullet point loons. No harmonica, drummer, yodeling singer, no singing beggar, no blind and desperate eyes swiveling heavenward, no nifty contrivance of hooks that hover, cunning little packs of sweets and savouries to be snapped up for a steal. No Ludo players, no lady lovers, no mouth movers and finger strummers, no veggie cutters and floor squatters, no card sharpers and seat swappers, no heart to heart gestures miming, what's mine will soon be yours. No identifiers by destination, me, Thane, you, Ambarnath. No shifting bums making room for yet more bums, generous, hanging half in, half out off in impossible accommodation. No street fighting biddies, no long distance buddies, no poshed up struggling models posing for hired shutterbugs. No loose long hair flying in the breeze. No breeze, upsetting the flow the shutterbugs want. No agents in dandy check pants taking the models calls. No assistants calling the shots, no instructions to simulate jo actual hota hai by rippling overhead handles in one swipe. None of that jo actual hota hai. No hawa kuch galat ja rahi hai because there is no wind here, wayward enough to go in the wrong direction. Know what really happens in this antiseptic world, which is not mine, not yet, maybe never, in which I ride trapped by my need for speed, impatient to exit, wondering who else is with me in this longing for the world outside, just outside this capsule which I must leave to revel again in glare and sweat and funk, snarl and din and blot, drama and consternation, awareness of time and disability, erosions, histories of heart, ramshackle, scaffoldings of skin. And the last poem that I'll read in the first set actually goes back to the beginning, my very, very first uh, book published by the Sahitya Academy, also at 50 rupees, no longer in print, smuggled into another book, Elsewhere, Where Else. It's called Dogs, Mobs, and Rock Concerts. Apologies to all those who've already heard it. Bombay Diary, April 7, 2003, an iconic date, the date the Rolling Stones played in Bombay. At 7 a.m. today, a pack of mad dogs rushed into a building and castrated a man. It happened too fast for the police to be called or the BSPCA van to rush in and take the raving canines away. Five dogs came, six left. At 12 noon today, a herd of hired goons drove up in a truck and threw flowers at a mob the mob which had assembled silently all morning, 
pulled the stalks out with their teeth and exploded in a fury of pamphlets. So the pamphlets read, stay out, outsiders, and then sang themselves into a stupor. The hired goons were fired for failing to disperse the crowd. At 7 p.m. today, a stadium flung open its gates to the sky. The earth rocked and the people stoned. Enormous rubber lips turned electric blue with the sound on the ground, crushed between a dressed-down executive and a made-up mother of two. An aging Indian singer shook his locks. In the champagne seats, the liquor baron bubbled tidily out of his ducks. At 7, 10, 12, 22 and midnight, the city felt a tremor of longing. Strange things had happened and passed it by. Tomorrow, all that would mark the hours would be the trains. The 7, 10, the 12, 22, the midnight, each rattling its chains, returning thousands to their cages till dawn. Thank you, Shampurna, and we seem to be having a Bombay evening today. Um, and what really strikes me is that the city uh, reflects that way, and some of the uh, things about it, it's full of violence, it's also full of love, and it is all knit together by various means of transport, and we who stay in the city are uh, influenced by these. You spoke of the metro, the train, the bomb blast. So I shall start with a small poem about Bombay and the people here. It's called Lal Mati. Uh, these poems, by the way, that I'm reading today are from this ma latest issue of the very lovely magazine, Indian Quarterly. Please do get hold of it. Uh, it has beautiful essays, fiction, and poetry. Lal Mati. From the dark wooden staircase worn down under five generations of footfall, from the BDD chawls at Teen Bhatti, Sat Rasta, Kala Chauki, Lal Bagh, and Shivdi, to the ST bus depots at Bombay Central, Parel and Dadar running extra services during April, September and October go. Eager, happy families, kids, Aji and Atya with brass boxes full of laddus and regzine bags with zippers that do not work. Carrying little gifts of children's clothes and plastic toys that will put stars in the eyes of nieces and nephews. Go these ST buses loaded with bodies aching for rest, for quiet, and for the tight embrace of brothers that stayed behind or went back defeated by the city kin they must necessarily invite to every family function if they don't feed them on the 13th day. Who else is there when they themselves pass? I'd like to read two more poems again. Um, one about what we witness these days almost on a daily basis. It's called White Noise. For the lone shoe on the road besides the black smoke, for the ore that wants to remain in the mountains, for the mountain that wants to remain by the sea, for the child who never returned from school, for the girls who disappeared to no one's great alarm, the boy casts a stone that flies, skimming the water, raising a million ripples in its wake, never sinking. Don't tell me what the end was, who won and who lost. Tell me what happened after the end, who cleaned the butt, blood and guts, picked up the pieces and how they carried on. Did they melt the guns to make plows and skites? Did they return unchanged to their children and wives? Words, 
wait at the banks of rivers for boats that will take them across. Beware the crocodile who offers his back. You stand in the desert looking for proofs, drawing theorems in the sand. A fawn runs through the forest, lighting fires in her wake. Listen to the white noise. The last poem I'd like to read is called Naming. Name the smell of a long distance train compartment, iron, Green regzine, dust, coal, food, sweat, and anticipation. What can you call the moment when our fingers intertwine in a crowd, but we avoid each other's eyes? It's our cipher that says, we are in this together no matter what. Name the moment when the gazelle that was frozen in fear leaps to freedom and the moment when the tigress, silently stalking her food, knows that her prey has smelt danger and will flee. Do you remember that split second before a fall when your ankle twists without warning and you go down in slow motion? Will you ever know why flocks of birds perennially flit around that dwarf of a tree telling its stories of their travels and none go near the banyan standing right beside when neither of it is fruiting. What is that urge to look when told to look away, to poke so bubbles that seem so unjustifiably happy? If only you knew its name, you'd call out to that moment which is receding along with the people on the platform as your train gathers speed and you realize that you no longer can redeem that promise nor admit to return the passion that the parting handshake was hinting at. Thank you. I think what poets do best is name the unnameable and say the unspeakable. And because we are at a poetry festival, I want to read this poem from my book, Space Gulliver, Chronicles of an Alien. Uh, Space Gulliver being a kind of alter ego to myself, handy ally in my adventures in Kent. This one is to all the poets in my life, in our lives. And it comes from a moment of sorrow in Kent. And I ascribe it all to Space Gulliver. Space Gulliver's sadness is monumental. Monumental her desire for friends who will draw her back into joy, poets who will write songs for her, poets she will write poems for, poets who will offer her room in their small one-room flats, poets who will understand that flatness of emotion is not the thing. Poets who write in languages she cannot read, Poets who vanish so swiftly, she must have dreamed them up. Poets who tower above her. Or stand easily beside her shoulder to shoulder at a bar. Poets she could smoke with in a fine drizzle. Poets she could smoke with under lampposts, sizzling with moths. Poets she could be loud with like 16 years of carousing and no knowledge it ends in death. Poets in slippers and shorts, poets who once had stammers, poets with preposterous and ironic eyebrows who will hold her as she stands in the sea. Poets who eat only raw food and watch the light fade. Poets so beautiful they lose everything. Poets with orange notebooks filled with sketches. Poets with cardamom on their tongues. Poets let loose in a country house. Poets reading, sitting in large carved chairs, wearing their glares in the middle of the night. Poets who can walk into bedrooms unembarrassed by shed skins and the detritus of thinking oneself unobserved. Poets who have chased monkeys and saved red books with golden letters from destruction. Poets with footballers' hands. 
Poets who buy her rings, poets who buy her drinks, poets who teach her words she may never need to use, poets who have vertigo, poets who once lived in brothels, poets who have children from many women, poets who build their own houses, then leave them for sheds in the garden, poets who hold her hand, Poets with very soft lips. Poets singing suddenly, haunting her long after. Poets on the floor, sitting cross-legged with the door ajar and the windows blowing, eating with their fingers, which they have never done before. Poets rambling, falling, quiet, wanting to cry. Poets catching buses and trains to see her. Poets leaving in small blue cars. Poets driving lime green citrons with sunroofs left open. So wind chills ears and everyone wears a cap. Poets careful not to trample on moss. Walking through Blair Witch Forest, linking arms, but not too close for fear of misunderstandings. Poets in jackets that make a swishing sound. Poets born in Ethiopia. Poets hugging poets. Poets writing in pink ink on the title pages of their books. Poets making promises, riding motorbikes. Poets being asked to leave. It's closing time. Poets in blue sweaters that cling, poets in boa constrictors, poets forgetting their lines and what it is they were meant to do. Poets momentarily lost, poets posing, taking photos, always the same photos. Poets kissing her on the mouth. But why does it have to be a poet, Space Gulliver thinks? Why not parachutist or pediatrician, poltergeist, or puppeteer, pickle maker, or punk? Because poets know. Poets know crows and alphabets. Poets know Fibonacci numbers and gypsum red D. Poets know anti-poem and counterpoint. Know tree and reed. No, there was nothing inside. No Beelzebub in Bombay, no canticles and karna. No wanting to be a roof is not a sign of insanity, but of love. No, kindness is everything. No, the eerie longing, no pelvises and shoulders, no old houses where men hung themselves, no beds in Peru, no figurines the shape of Amsterdam, no linguine and lascivious, no philharmonic. Oysters, hieroglyphics, and axes. Poets, no girls from A to Z, no one camel clans in Babylon, no lost earrings in grass, no specters in glass, no the basket weaver's love. Poets know how to remain alone at the end of a rhyme that will not deceive you. Poets, no cliffs, and the circus animal's desertion, the rag and bone, shop of the heart. Poets know. Long gray beards and glittering eyes. No salt and sea and synesthesia. No horizon where she came from, knowing nothing but the daft, unsolvable equation. So one of the other things about uh, claiming various tongues is translation. And I read a very short OV. Uh, I have translated the OVs, which are work songs of uh, Bahina Bai Saudhari, who was an uh, unlettered peasant poet from Maharashtra, and she sung these OVs. Uh, this OV is about Mahir, and um, uh, it talks about this woman working in her courtyard. And uh, while she's working, she's singing an OV. And across the hedge sits a yogi who is meditating. And he is disturbed in his meditation because she's singing, so he's annoyed. And Bahina Bai writes, yo, the yogi says, Bas, Basla mi deva dhyani, kaya madi he sankata, bai bandh kar tujha, tonda tali, vata vata. 
माझे माहेर माहेर सदा गाणे तुझ्या ओठी मग माहेरून आली सासर आले कशासाठी इन इंग्लिश व्हेरी क्विकली द योगी सेज हिअर आय सिट इन मेडिटेशन अँड वॉट्स दिस इन्फर्नल डिस्टर्बन्स वुमन स्टॉप द ब्लॅबरिंग दॅट फ्लोज नॉन स्टॉप फ्रॉम युअर टंग माय माहेर माय माहेर इज युअर अनएंडिंग रिफ्रेन देन व्हाय डिड यू एव्हर कम टू दिस सासर फ्रॉम युअर बिलावेड माहेर द सासूर वाशीन आन्सर्स इन थ्री शॉर्ट सेंटेन्सेस अरे लागले डोहाळे सांगे शेतातली माती डोहाळे आर फूड क्रेविंग्स टिपिकल ऑफ प्रेग्नन्सी अरे लागले डोहाळे सांगे शेतातली माती गाते माहेराचे गाणे लेक येईल रे पोटी देय देय योग्या ध्यान ऐक काय मी सांगते लेकीच्या माहेरासाठी माय सासरी रा सासरी नांदते देव कुठे देव कुठे भरी सनी जो उरला अरे उरी सनी माझ्या माहेरात समावला इन इंग्लिश द सॉइल फ्रॉम द फील्ड सेस्ट मी अरे द डोहाळे आर अपॉन यू अँड सो आय सिंग द सॉंग ऑफ माय माहेर फॉर द डॉटर हु विल ग्रो इन माय बेली Listen, listen carefully, O yogi, hear out what I have to say, so that her daughter might have a mahir to go to, does the mother in her sasar stay. Where is this God you seek, this God after permeating all creation, when he still remained? Then he went to my mahir, and there he was contained. Thank you. Thank you, Shampurna, and thank you, everyone. Please buy this book. Yes, thank you very much. That was Speaking in Tongues, Anjali Purohit and Sampurna Chatterjee.